Hi, this is Craig Stocks here for Utah Desert Remote Observatories. Today we're going to talk about some of the fundamentals of Photoshop and especially a layer-based, non-destructive workflow. I hope you'll join me. So to start with, let's talk a little bit about what I mean by a layer-based, non-destructive workflow. A uh, non-destructive workflow is really one that maintains layers and adjustment layers intact. And basically, I never make a change that I can't undo later. Uh, even after I save the file, close the computer, whatever, I can come back anytime in the future, revisit any of the adjustments I've made, and make further adjustments or change my mind about something I've done. Generally, I don't care about file size. Um, large files are just large files. They take up more space, but space is relatively inexpensive. Uh, usually that means I have to save my Photoshop files in what's called a large file format, which is a .psb instead of a .psd Photoshop format. And I, I am using a kind of newish laptop uh, with 128 gig of RAM. and one thing, I almost never uh, flatten a file or merge layers uh, because that's an extremely non-destructive thing because, or an extremely destructive step because you're committing in all of those changes that you have carefully done with adjustment layers and individual layers. You're merging all those in and kind of burning those into pixels and then you can't, you know, once you've made a chocolate cake, it's hard to get the chocolate out of the cake. So, some of the uh, fundamentals that we'll look at. Uh, destructive editing would be adjustments applied directly to a layer. Uh, Non-destructive would be using adjustment layers, which I mentioned earlier. Um, destructive is merging layers as opposed to keeping individual layers. <clears throat> I see a lot of people duplicate a layer and then work on that duplicate layer. That's really just another form of destructive editing. Uh, keep the layers intact. If you need to do certain operations such as applying filters, you can convert a layer to a smart object which retains all of the original data intact. And as I mentioned, never flatten an image, uh, especially not a master file. Always keep your master files uh, fully intact with all of the layers. So some of the fundamentals of Photoshop um, <clears throat> Layers is one of the key elements of Photoshop, and so I want to take some time to talk about what layers are. Uh, every layer has the potential of at least one layer mask, which you can use to selectively hide what's happening on that layer. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about adjustment layers and how those are different from pixel bearing layers. And then the last interesting topic that we're really going to get into is blending modes. Those aren't used too much for normal photography, uh, but they're quite useful for some steps in astrophotography. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking about uh, layer blending modes. So in Photoshop, we have layers. And if you look at the Photoshop interface, I use what's called the Essentials interface. And over on the lower right-hand side is the Layers palette. And this is where you would see the individual layers. Each one shows up with its own layer icon. In the middle, just for reference, I have the uh, adjustments palette. And so you can quickly pick an adjustment layer from the icons here. <clears throat> and then at the top on the right hand side is the properties panel. And the properties panel is where you would see the current settings for an adjustment layer, for instance. But will focus primarily on the layers themselves today. Uh, this just zooming in, you can see each layer shows up as, you know, as a layer. It has a, an icon that shows what's on that layer. Uh, there's an eyeball that lets you turn visibility of that layer on and off. And something that we'll talk about more as we get further into it is right here where it says normal. That's the blending mode. And there's a whole lot of different potential blending modes that you can use. And we'll probably also touch on the opacity, which how opaque is the layer. 
So think of layers as a, like a stack of papers. Um, they're really kind of the most fundamental part of Photoshop. And in general, when you look at the, the layer palette or the layer stack, uh, you're going to see the one that's on top. Uh, just like if you put a, one piece of paper on top of another, the one on top hides the ones below. But Photoshop does have tools to uh, control how a layer on top interacts with the layers below. Now, there's really two types of layers. There are pixel bearing layers and there are adjustment layers. A pixel bearing layer is basically your image or a part of your image. Uh, each pixel has RGB values if you're working with a color image. And of course, it's the mix of red, green, and blue that creates the, the rainbow of colors. Layers, as I mentioned, are normally opaque. And we want to avoid directly changing pixels on a pixel bearing layer because that would be considered a destructive step. Adjustment layers, on the hand, uh, just control the view of what's below them. So that it only can affects what's below. It doesn't contain any pixels. Uh, but it's kind of like looking through glasses that will affect how something looks. The uh, important part is that when you save a document, when you save it with those layers intact in a PSD or a TIFF format, it saves the adjustment layer along with the current settings. So you can darken, light, and change contrast, change color, change saturation, and just reopen the file and change it again. It's never really baked into the pixels. It's just affecting how it looks uh, until at some point you may convert it into a JPEG and resize it and post it on Facebook or something. Some of the common adjustment layers are levels, which in, in, in PixInsight terms, that would be kind of similar to the uh, histogram transformation tool. Uh, levels and curves both are somewhat like uh, histogram and curves transformation color balance, hue saturation, selective color. You know, these are all pretty common adjustment layers. <clears throat> Most important is they don't change the pixel, only change the look of the pixel. And maybe that will make more sense when we get into some examples. Every layer, whether it's a pixel bearing layer or an adjustment layer, can have a mask. And a mask is like hiding or erasing a portion of a layer. So it will hide some or all of a layer or the effect of a uh, adjustment layer. Black on a mask hides that layer or that portion of the layer. Um, white reveals that layer. And we'll play with that a little bit more, but the, the power of that is if you paint on a mask with black paint, uh, in effect you're hiding, uh, it would be similar to erasing pixels, but erasing is destructive, hiding with a mask is non-destructive. Painting with white restores what had been hidden, and that's the key difference. If I paint with black to hide something, I can come back and paint with white and get back to where I started. If I erased, I can't unerase. And again, masks are saved with the documents, so they're reversible. So with that, let's pop into Photoshop, and we'll look at some examples of how this really works. And to start with, let's just look at a very simple document. Uh, if we look over on the right-hand side, we can see this document has two layers. One is green on top, and if I turn that layer off, we'll see that there's kind of a reddish layer underneath. And when I turn the upper layer on, as I mentioned, it hides what's below. Now, something that we don't want to do, but just for example, if I grab the eraser tool, and I'm going to use the left and right bracket keys to change the, the size of the eraser. Okay. The Photoshop is acting strange. I don't have the eraser tool. There we go. So this is the eraser tool. I was on the um, gradient tool before I, I clicked in the wrong place, apparently. So this is the erase tool. And if we erase <clears throat> part of this green layer, just as you would expect, we can create a hole in it. And if you look at the layer thumbnail, you can even see that there's a hole in it now. 
if I turn the red layer that's underneath off, you see that what shows is this little kind of gray and white checkerboard pattern. Uh, that's Photoshop's uh, code for a transparent layer. So right now there's nothing here in the center. It's, that would be just transparent. If I turn the red layer back on, we see the red layer through that hole in the green layer. But that's destructive because if I had erased details of a nebula or something, uh, it would be hard to paint those easily paint those back in. So let's go to the history palette here and let's just go back to before I used the eraser. And instead let's use a mask to do the same thing. So to get a mask I can go to layer, layer mask, and a, we can either hide a add a mask that reveals all or hides all. Let's do a reveal all. And you can see now a little white thumbnail has shown up next to the layer thumbnail. This is the mask. It's something real important to keep track of and it may be hard to see in the video but there's a little double outline around the mask. If I click on the green layer icon you'll see that double outline move over to the, to the layer if I click on the mask, it'll move back over to the mask. It's important to know when you start working with layers and masks whether you're working on the layer or on the mask. And right now we want to work on the mask and we want to kind of do the same thing that we just did with the eraser tool, which we can do by painting black onto this mask. So I will grab the brush tool over here and change my opacity to 100% opacity and 100% flow. And we're painting with black as the foreground color. If you have something else, you can just tap the D key and that will restore the white and black default colors. You can tap the X key and just switch between foreground and background. So right now I will be painting with black at 100% opacity and 100% flow. And if I make the brush about the same size as we had the uh, erase tool and paint with black, and again I'm painting on the mask, and just like before, we have put a hole in the mask. If I turn the red layer off, we can see that that's transparent, but instead of having a hole in the green, we've painted black on the mask. The beauty of this is if I want to restore some or all of what I painted away with the mask, I can just tap the X key to change to white, and let's just make the brush smaller, and let's restore portions of this. So I can very selectively bring some of that, all of it back. I can switch to black and erase more things. I can go back to white and undo one or two of those if I masked out something that I really want to keep. So that's really the value of a mask is it's non-destructive, reversible, it's saved with the document as long as you don't flatten or merge layers. So you can always come back and change whatever it is that you wanted, wanted to do differently on that mask. Uh, painting with a brush is probably the easiest way to paint black or white on a mask but you can use other tools such as the uh, the gradient tool which I grabbed earlier and if I make black my foreground color draw a gradient from the left you can see now we've drawn a, a gradient on the mask so it's gradually going from fully masked to fully unmasked and so forth. Um, I think I'll leave masks there and we'll talk a little bit about adjustment layers. Um, I could certainly go to layer adjustments and let's just say uh, brightness contrast. That's a simple one to understand. I can change the brightness or the contrast of this green layer and when I click OK I have actually changed the color of those pixels from what they were before into that darker green. and. The problem with that is if I decide, oh, I, I want to change that to something different, I have to change these again. And just like making a Xerox copy over and over and over, 
um, making changes over and over and over begin to degrade the image and create artifacts. So we don't want to do that. What we want to do instead, I'll just go back in time, instead we will use an adjustment layer. So one way to get there is layer new adjustment layer. So rather than adjustment, this is new adjustment layer. And let's do a brightness contrast. And it's asking me for a name, and I'll just accept the default. First of all, notice what happened on the layers palette. We now have a new layer. This is our brightness contrast adjustment layer. And it lives as its own layer. And in fact, it has its own mask. Um, in the properties panel up at the top, we can see sliders for brightness and contrast. So I can change my brightness and contrast and just you know change this to my heart's content. I could save the document. When I reopen it, it would look just like this. And I could change it again. I could decide I don't want this at all. I could just grab this layer and drag it down to the trash can to delete it. Uh, everything is non-destructive. Nothing's ever really committed. Uh, the ones that you use most commonly are probably the levels is one I use quite a bit because it's very easy to just move the sliders in and out to affect that or move the midpoint for an overall brightness. The color balance is another one I use quite a bit which lets you change color balance of a, an image. And hue saturation which lets you change, obviously, the, the hue and the color saturation. And as with anything, if you change your mind, you can come back and undo it. You can reset any of them with the reset button. Or you can just delete that whole adjustment layer if you change your mind completely. So that's adjustment layers. The last thing to talk about is blending modes, and I'll just briefly introduce them here. If I click on this drop down where it says normal, you can see there's a whole list of different options. And what these do is affect how this layer interacts with the layers below. And normal is the default. That means it's just opaque and it hides what's below. There's a group that generally use this layer to darken what's below. So darken, multiply, color burn, linear burn, darker color are all different ways of using this layer to darken <clears throat> the layer below. And you can get some interesting effects if you want to just play with it. The next group is light. And generally, these will use the pixels on this layer to lighten the view of what's below. Then we have a group that interact both lightening and darkening. And that's overlay, soft light, hard light, vivid light linear light, pen light, and hard mix. And again, you can get some interesting effects just by choosing a layer blending mode. And then next we have difference, exclusion, subtract, divide. Uh, those are somewhat specialized. Um, and then the last group, hue, takes only the hue from this layer and overlays it over the layer below. Saturation takes just the saturation from this layer. Color takes both the hue and the saturation. And then last, luminosity just takes the luminosity of this layer and applies it to the view below. And you might already be thinking, oh gosh, if I have a, a, a luminance layer of a galaxy, for instance, that I want to apply to some RGB data, uh, could I just put that layer on top of the RGB data and put it in luminosity blending mode and just get luminosity from that. And absolutely you can. That's uh, pretty much one of the ways you would do it. So those are the blending modes. But let's jump in and actually see how we might use them in a real uh, astro image. So here we have an image of the Trifid Nebula. And this is a simple, fairly simple RGB image. Um, but let's dig into the layers a little bit and see what we have here. At the bottom of the layer stack, you see that there's an RGB image. And I've already done a fair amount of editing, but this is more or less how the RGB data would come out of PixInsight. And then on the top, we have two layers containing the stars. 
And again, that's how the stars would come out of PixInsight uh, after using a star removal tool like uh, Star Exterminator, which is the one I like to use. And as we mentioned before, we have the uh, eyeball icons here. That I can turn the layers off that contain the stars. And there we have a starless version of the Trifid Nebula in just simple RGB. But <clears throat> what if we want to add some narrowband data to this? And if you've already been looking ahead, you can see I've got sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen layers here uh, above the RGB data, but below the stars. Now, if I just turn one of these on, let's just start with sulfur. If I just turn that layer on, uh, that also is how it would come out of uh, PixInsight after processing and star removal and, and some cleanup. And we want to figure out how to blend this with the layer below. And remember, we talked about the blending modes, and that's something that we can use to determine how this layer will blend with the layer below. So to start with, let's think about what kind of a blending mode would work well for this. Uh, generally, we have bright spots here that, in fact, are probably brighter than what's below. And our light and blending modes actually do just that. They use this layer to brighten what's below. And the two that you would use most commonly are either lighten or screen. And there's a fundamental difference between the two. Lighten will use pixels on this layer that are lighter than the layer below and use those to brighten whatever is on that layer below with whatever's on this layer. Screen, on the other hand, uses every pixel and its brightness to brighten what's below. So even a pixel that's almost black will still have some effect of brightening up the layer below. So it's a more aggressive way of brightening, but it also includes all the data instead of just the data that's brighter. So most of the time in a situation like this, screen is probably going to work better, but we will need to tone down the layer that we're adding. So in this case we're adding sulfur and let's do two things. First let's tone it down a little bit with a levels adjustment layer and that's what this layer does. I just have moved the sliders so that it's a little bit less assertive. It's still brightening what's there. Uh, if I turn this layer off and on you can see it's having an effect but now it's mostly having its effect here in the uh, core. Next thing we want to do is think about what color do we want this to be. And sulfur is typically a reddish color. Uh, in fact, it's more red than hydrogen, which we normally think of as red. So let's make this primarily red. And the way we're going to do that, because we're in screen blending mode, we can use a simple curves layer to change the color of this layer. So let me turn that adjustment layer on. And you can see what happened is now it's become kind of a reddish orange. And if we look at the curves layer, you see what we've, we haven't really changed the overall curve, which is this black line, but you can see we've changed the individual green, red, and blue components. So in effect, we have changed, let's turn off RGB and see this layer by itself. We've changed the color of this layer. And we can do it very visually, uh, just by individually selecting, for instance, the red layer. <clears throat> if we want it to be more red or less red, we can adjust the... And usually it's easiest to just move the right-hand point to change the color contribution of this layer. I did leave a little bit of blue in here. You could take all the blue out, or you could put more blue in, or somewhere in between. Um, the green, we actually do have a bit of a curve here, and what that's doing is putting a little bit more yellow into the highlights, <clears throat> and then by pulling down, we're putting a little bit less yellow, and then by extension, more red into the shadows. And there's not really much over here, so it doesn't really matter where the far right-hand slider is. But in this case, I'm using kind of a reddish-orange for sulfur. Let's look at the oxygen uh, the same way. This is just the RGB image. So let's put this also in screen blending mode. 
And again, it's too bright, so we'll use this Levels Adjustment Layer to tone it down. And then we'll use the Curves to change the color. And in this case, if you look at the red, we've taken all of the red out of the uh, Oxygen Layer. We've left all of the blue, so blue is still full strength. And then the green, we've you can adjust up and down, kind of kind of to taste. You want it to be more cyan, or more purpley, or somewhere in between. And this is really just a matter of visually adjusting this to taste. Last is the hydrogen, and in this case, we'll go again to screen blending mode, tone it down a little bit, adjust the color so that it's primarily red. And it's still a little bit bright here in the center, so we want to darken this center a little bit. And the way I chose to do that is using a blank layer. And you can see there's a little bit of, of paint on there. You can see the checkerboard background, which implies it's transparent, with a little bit of something painted on there. And let's turn this layer on. And typically we would want this layer to be in soft light, blending mode. And once it's in soft light blending mode, I can paint with a black brush. In any place I paint with black in relatively low opacity, let's say we want 10% opacity, and I can get 10% opacity here by just tapping the one key. If I paint with black, that will darken anywhere where I'm painting. If I paint with white, it will brighten. So what this layer is doing is just subtly darkening some of this core. If I go the other direction, it would brighten. And in this case, because we're adding color, it would be brightening that color. Or we could just leave that off entirely. It's, you know, this is really, these are the tools. What you do with the tools is the creativity. So we might say that's the kind of the starting point for the combined RGB image. Uh, we might then want to add some global adjustments. So, for instance, we might add a global color balance and decide we want more red or less red uh, just by moving these sliders back and forth. And again, this is just done to taste uh, based on what you want the image to look like. You might decide we want to darken the image overall, which we can do with a levels adjustment. Uh, you might want to darken this core a little bit more. Uh, again, the beauty of an adjustment layer, let's add another levels adjustment layer. And we'll just move the, this metal slider over to darken the core so that we like the way it looks. Then let's go to the layer mask. And what we really want to do is hide this effect from everywhere except in the center. And the most direct way to do that would be to grab the brush tool, paint with 100% opacity with black paint, and then just hide that darkening effect everywhere we don't want it to have an effect. And if we go too far, we can just switch to white and paint it back in. So you can just kind of iteratively go back and forth and adjust how that mask allows this adjustment layer to be manifested. And then if you want to go back and fine tune the, the adjustment, you can still go back to the layers panel and adjust that. Lastly, let's come to the stars. And incidentally, using the screen or light and blending mode is a very common way of, of mixing colors together and adding them like this in uh, Photoshop. The stars were subtracted or removed in PixInsight using Star Exterminator and the Unscreen tool. So the usual approach to put those back would be to put those in a, in a layer, and that would be in screen blending mode, and that puts those stars back kind of the same way they came out. And to me, to my eye, that works fine here in the center where it's going on top of other bright nebula and that you need some punch for the stars to punch through. But they wind up being just a little bit too prominent around the perimeter. Now another way of adding stars 
is to use lightened blending mode, which if you recall, lightened blending mode does a great job of lighten, using the pixels on this layer to lighten what's below, but it's, it's not aggressive enough to have stars really shine through where we have bright nebula behind it. So what I do frequently is use a combination of the two where I have dark background and I don't want the stars to be as punchy. I'll use lighten blending mode and then I'll make another copy of that star layer and I'll put it in screen blending mode which does a better job of pulling out the stars on top of these bright nebula but then use a layer mask to hide the screened stars so that we're only letting the screened you know, really bright stars show through where we have bright nebula and use the dimmer lighten blending mode in the background and again that's just you know finding a balance that uh, to your eye looks like the the right balance of being able to see stars and being able to see the nebula behind it so that's the way I added sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen to the uh, RGB data. And of course the beauty of it is if I decide I, no, I really wanted just RGB, I can just turn those layers off and we're back to just our simple RGB data that we started with. So you can have all of it, you can have some of it. Uh, these are tools. Uh, the tools are used just in service of your vision. And so ultimately your vision of how you want to process an image and bring it to life is the art part of astrophotography. So a lot to cover in a short amount of time. Uh, it probably wasn't uh, as short as I would like it to be, but I hope you found this useful. <clears throat> if you have any questions, be sure to drop them in the contents. Uh, if you like content like this, um, you can like and subscribe to the video. Uh, that always helps and it lets me know what kind of, of content is most useful. And with that, I think I'll end here. So I hope you have a great day today and an even better night tonight under a clear, dark sky. Thanks.